Good evening. My name is Randy Butler, and I have the distinct honor of being the president of the faculty, staff, and students that comprise the 18th best public university in the United States, Southwestern Oklahoma State University. We welcome you here this evening for an historic and interesting program related to the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Our seminar tonight, The Missiles of Oklahoma, will consist of two speakers, Mr. Landry Brewer, Professor of History here at Southwestern, and Mr. Michael Dobbs, an internationally known journalist and author. Each speaker will make their presentations, and then we will have a short question and answer session at the end of each appearance. If you have further questions, I'm sure Mr. Dobbs and Mr. Brewer will be available afterwards. Our first speaker is Landry Brewer. Professor Brewer is a graduate of Elk City High School and Southwestern Oklahoma State University, where he received both his bachelor's and master's degrees. He is currently a Swasu history instructor at the Sayer campus. Landry's research about Southwest Oklahoma's Cold War nuclear missile sites has resulted in his having a paper published soon in an academic journal, a historic marker being placed in Greer County, a trip to the University of Texas at Austin in September to present a poster about the historical marker project at the annual meeting of the American Association for State and Local History, the story being featured last June on KFOR TV's Is This a Great State or What? and several presentations to civic groups between Shamrock, Texas, and Weatherford. Landry and his wife, Erin, have five children and live in Elk City. Please welcome Landry Brewer. Thank you, President Butler. Thank you to the university for hosting this wonderful event. There are three specific people I need to thank for tonight in no particular order. Sharon Manning, my dean at the Sayer campus. Uh, this event is really her idea. She, back in the spring, said, why don't she know I've been doing this research and writing and was pursuing a historic marker. And she said, well, I think this would be a good continuing education seminar. Let's do that. And I said, OK. You're my boss, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. The second person, so thank you, Sharon. The second person I need to thank is my dad for two reasons. First of all, I need to thank him for working at the granite and cache missile sites while they were being built in 1961 and two. So thanks for that, Dad. And thank you for pointing me towards some primary source documents a year ago this month that really started me researching these sites and getting to figure out just how important that this, uh, these missiles were. And then, again, I need to thank President Butler for a couple of reasons. One year ago, he came to the Sayre campus and he said, have you ever thought about being published in the Chronicles of Oklahoma, which is the Journal of the State Historical Society? And I said, well, sounds like a pretty good idea. You're my boss, too. You signed my paycheck, so I'll try to do that. And then it was his idea to run with Sharon's idea. And he said, well, let's make it a two-campus event. Let's host one event at the Sayer campus, which we did last week, and then let's have an event here at Weatherford. And I said, sounds like a great idea. And then he said, let's bring in Michael Dobbs. And I was pretty excited. Very excited, in fact, to get to participate in this event. Uh, thinking about how exciting this was going to be, getting to appear here and to speak with Michael Dobbs, a few weeks ago it all started to set in, and, and I said to my wife, Erin, We've been married for about 22 years, and we've known each other for a long time. And I said, you've known me for a long time, Aaron. Did you ever think in your wildest dreams that I would get to speak at an event like this with somebody like Michael Dobbs? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, Landry, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> the Oklahoma Historical Society publishes a quarterly journal called The Chronicles of Oklahoma. I did my research a year ago, I got into the documents, I found out that there was a story here, there was history here, and people needed to know it. I submitted it, and the Chronicles of Oklahoma said, we'll publish it. And it is scheduled to go to press November 1st, 
and hopefully be available to the public by mid-December. I'm from Western Oklahoma. I grew up in Western Oklahoma. My father had worked at two of these missile sites and I grew up knowing almost nothing about them. I was barely even aware that they existed. I was pretty ignorant and I've realized that people my age largely are, people my age and younger, and it's important to me to inform the public, to inform you, to inform readers, and I'm happy to do that. Well, during this process, I decided that at least one of the Altus area missile sites deserves some public recognition. So I petitioned the State Historical Society to place a marker, a historical marker, at the missile site near Willow in Greer County. The OHS granted my request, said, we'll let you raise the money to pay for it, and I did. I partnered with the old Greer County Museum in Mangum to raise the money to pay for the marker. I learned that Oklahoma doesn't make these types of markers, by the way. We get them from Ohio. And Siwa Studios in Ohio informed me a couple of weeks ago that the marker should be on its way, and it arrived. The marker has arrived in Greer County. Now for the missiles. I need to place these missiles in their proper context. Though the United States and the Soviet Union were allies during World War II, we quickly became adversaries when World War II ended in 1945. In March 1946, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave a speech in President Truman's home state of Missouri at Westminster College. There in Fulton, Missouri, and in the speech he said, an iron curtain has descended across the continent of Europe. During World War II, the Soviet army, known as the Red Army, marched west into several Eastern European nations on its way to Berlin to force a German surrender. As I tell my students where the Red Army marched, communism usually followed. The Red Army occupied East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Poland and many other countries and forced them to accept communist governments that were controlled by Moscow. And at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union controlled Eastern Europe. The Iron Curtain that Churchill spoke of divided the Communist East and the Free West. Well, the United States believed that the Soviet Union wanted to conquer all of Europe and maybe the rest of the world as it spread communism. So the United States adopted a policy of containing Soviet communism. President Truman announced that the U.S. would provide economic, political, and even military support to nations that were under threat. And we started with aid to Greece and Turkey per this new Truman Doctrine. By 1947, this conflict, pitting the Soviet Union and the Communist East against the United States and the Democratic West was being called the Cold War. The US and the Soviet Union were never officially at war with each other during the next four decades, but the threat of war existed. The United States ended World War II against Japan in August 1945 by dropping two atomic bombs there. One atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city Hiroshima. Japan didn't surrender. So, three days later, we dropped a second atomic bomb on the Japanese city Nagasaki. These two bombs ultimately killed more than 200,000 Japanese and destroyed both cities. Two bombs killed more than 200,000 people. Only the United States had the atomic bomb when World War II ended in 1945, but that atomic monopoly was short-lived. The Soviets got the atomic bomb in August 1949, and Americans were scared. In fact, as my students would say and my kids would say, we were like, no way. We were kind of freaking out. It was a scary time. The atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were dropped from airplanes, like the Enola Gay. Eventually, though, both the United States and the Soviet Union developed long-range ballistic missiles to carry nuclear bombs great distances. In August 1957, the Soviet Union successfully launched the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, a missile capable of carrying a nuclear bomb thousands of miles from one continent to another and Americans were scared. Especially when, two months later, the Soviets launched the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik. The perception was that the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States in technological capability and weapons production. It was time to catch up. 
To counter the Soviet Union's Cold War nuclear threat in the 1950s, the United States government began creating an offensive nuclear capability. That included Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, capable of reaching the Soviet Union. The first American ICBM was the Atlas Missile. Southwest Oklahoma, near Altus Air Force Base, played a crucial role in the nation's nuclear arsenal from 1960 through 1965 by building several missile launch sites and housing Atlas F Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. An impressive weapon to behold, the Atlas F missile was 82 and a half feet long and 10 feet wide. It weighed 18,000 pounds empty and more than 267,000 pounds when it was fueled. Its nuclear warhead delivered a four megaton yield, which means it was roughly equivalent to four million tons of TNT. Four million tons of TNT. During flight, the missile reached a speed of 16,000 miles per hour. It could travel more than 6,700 miles in 43 minutes, which means in the time it takes me to drive from my home in Elk City to the Fine Arts Center on the campus of Southwestern Oklahoma State University in Weatherford, an Atlas missile fired from Southwest Oklahoma could reach the Soviet Union. With the nuclear warhead, more than 200 times more powerful than the atomic bombs we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Originally, the location of the Atlas launch sites was determined exclusively by the missile's range. They had to be close enough to hit their targets in the Soviet Union. Later, other factors that influenced the placement of the sites was that they be inland, out of range of Soviet submarine-launched missiles, that they be close to support facilities, and as a cost-cutting measure, that they be built on government property whenever possible. The sites near Altus satisfied these criteria. Nationally, six Atlas F squadrons with 12 missile launch sites each were deployed near Air Force bases in Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, New Mexico, New York, and Oklahoma. As the bombardment arm of the US Air Force, Strategic Air Command, or SAC, controlled most of our nuclear weapons. SAC assumed control of Altus Air Force Base in the 1950s, and the Atlas F missile was assigned to the 577th Strategic Missile Squadron located there. The locations near Altus chosen for the 12 launch sites were Lone Wolf, Snyder, Cash, Frederick, Krita, Hollis, Russell, Willow, Hobart, Manitou, where my grandfather worked, by the way. My father worked at Granite and Cache at those sites while they were being built. His father, Clyde Brewer, worked at the Manitou site while it was being built. Granite was another site, and finally, Fargo, Texas. So 12 sites near Altus Air Force Base, within about 40 miles, 11 sites in southwest Oklahoma, one just across the Red River in North Texas. The Air Force turned to the Army Corps of Engineers to build both the Atlas missile launch sites and the necessary supporting facilities. Because of the underground depth of each silo and overall size of each launch site, the Atlas F facilities were the most difficult to build among the Atlas series. The task was monumental. Each Atlas missile near Altus was stored vertically in a hard underground silo. Each silo about 174 feet deep with a diameter of 52 feet to withstand a bomb blast at the surface. The walls of the silo were built of heavily reinforced concrete and ranged from two and a half feet thick at the bottom to nine feet thick at the top. Within the silo, the missile and its support system were supported by a steel framework called the crib, which hung from the walls of the silo on four sets of huge springs. Connected to each silo by a 50-foot tunnel was the underground launch control center, or LCC, 
Its two floors housed the launching equipment and was where a five-man Air Force crew lived 24 hours a day. The first floor of the launch control center included living quarters with a kitchen and shower for the crews that operated the missile. The LCC's second floor contained the consoles to fire it. I had looked at this photo up on the screen for quite a while until I realized, when you look closely at this console here, there's a piece of paper right here. Someone has taken a piece of paper and written the word secret. High-tech security. Construction on each silo began with an open-cut excavation down to a depth of about 40 feet. From there, the silo was mined to its final depth of 174 feet. Within the silo, workers built a huge steel framework equivalent to a 15-story building. So a, at least a 15-story building, at least a 15-story building could fit within each silo. All to support the missile and its related equipment. Each silo required over 1,800 tons of reinforcing steel and about 6,000 cubic yards of high-strength concrete. Though the silo was built to house an Atlas missile underground, the top of each silo was flush with the ground surface. The doors at the top of the silo, very heavy doors, weighing 65 tons, but they were opened and closed hydraulically, and when they were closed, they completely sealed the silo. Needing hundreds of acres for land for the missile sites in southwest Oklahoma and north Texas, the United States government exercised something called eminent domain and took ownership of the private land near Altus Air Force Base. Excavation on the first Altus Air Force Base missile sites began in May 1960. This was a symbolic groundbreaking ceremony that featured the mayors of all 12 of the communities where each missile site was located. It also included such luminaries as United States Senator Robert S. Kerr. Constructing the missile sites was dangerous. Nationwide, and remember this was a national program, there were six hubs nationally that included Altus Air Force Base with 12 missiles surrounding each. So there are at least 72 Atlas F missiles. Nationwide, more than 50 men died building these sites. Three men died while building the Altus area missile sites. The May 8, 1960 edition of the Altus Times Democrat newspaper carried a front-page story about the downing of American pilot Francis Gary Powers while flying a U-2 spy plane on a reconnaissance mission over the Soviet Union a week earlier. The story relays that Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, remember the guy who banged his shoe on the table and said, we will bury you? Nikita Khrushchev announced that Powers was a $2,500 a month agent of the CIA, which he was, and he recommended that Powers be tried for espionage, which he was, and sentenced to a few years of prison followed by hard labor. What happened though, we, uh, we got him back. The United States had a Soviet spy in custody, and after Powers had spent a couple of years in prison in the Soviet Union, we swapped our spy for him, and we got Powers back. Also, that Tom Hanks could make the movie Bridge of Spies. A day after informing its readers that Powers was in Soviet custody, the Altus Times Democrat announced that the work had begun at the Lone Wolf missile site. The newspaper described the site's location as just east of State Highway 41 between Lake Altus and Lone Wolf. Work was also to begin at the Snyder and Cash sites the same day. The Altus area missile sites were built as Dwight Eisenhower's presidency was ending, and the two men vying to be his successor in the White House were battling each other on the campaign trail. A couple of young guys named Kennedy and Nixon. The September 26, 1960 edition of the Altus Times Democrat carried a front page story about the first ever televised presidential debate to be held that night between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. The same edition of the Altus newspaper carried several pictures of the Snyder Atlas silo under construction. 
illustrating the immensity of the massive undertaking. Democratic presidential candidate John Kennedy visited Oklahoma just days before the 1960 election. The same day that Kennedy's Oklahoma visit was front page news, the Altus Times Democrat reported that the first missile site construction fatality had occurred at the Hobart site. Otis Hobson, a 31-year-old construction worker from Lampasas, Texas, was electrocuted when a gust of wind blew a cable on the end of a large crane into a 440-volt power line. He'd finished work at the Willow site and was preparing to begin work on the Hobart site on day one when the accident occurred. He'd been at the Hobart site on his first day there, less than half an hour when he died. The Altus Times Democrat also reported the December 28, 1960 death of an Arkansas man while working at the Cache missile site. He was working in the silo when he fell about 90 feet to his death. A Vernon, Texas man became the third Altus area missile site fatality March 24, 1961. The Altus newspaper reported that construction worker Keith Arnold was preparing for concrete to be poured on the launch control center at the Fargo, Texas site when he fell approximately 30 feet to his death. According to the newspaper, Arnold's pregnant wife, unaware of her husband's death, was admitted about an hour after the accident to the hospital in Vernon to give birth. The sites were completed by crews that worked 24 hours a day. In fact, I'm told that at Willow in Greer County, there was a cafe in the early 1960s, and the Willow Cafe began staying open 24 hours to accommodate all of the workers and make some money. The August 1st, 1961, Altus Times Democrat reported that the Snyder missile site had been completed and transferred to the Air Force. The newspaper also noted that this launching complex alone required, required removing 60,000 yards of earth, pouring 6,900 yards of concrete, and using over 537 tons of steel. It also said that each silo could have held over 2.5 million gallons of water, and enough concrete was used in each of the complexes to pave 30 city blocks with a 6-inch layer. How did the missiles make their way to Willow and Granite and Cash. The Atlas missiles were flown to Altus Air Force Base by planes like C-133s, and then they were loaded onto trucks and driven to the missile sites for housing and possible use. Can you imagine being in your farm and one of those rolls by? Hey, Dad, what's that? Possible use. That was our greatest fear. That's why we had them. We thought we might need them, but also to deter the Soviets from launching a first strike. Well, our fears were nearly realized. We came awfully close to our greatest fears being realized. That is nuclear war. As we entered, as the Cold War entered, as the world entered, arguably the most dangerous two-week span in our history, the history of the world. In October 1962, 55 years ago, the United States discovered that the Soviet Union was placing nuclear missiles 90 miles south of Florida in Cuba. Potentially hot showdown nearing, Russia claims U.S. set stage for war was the front page headline of the October 23rd, 1962 Altus Times Democrat. As a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, all 12 of the Atlas F missiles near Altus Air Force Base were placed on alert. President Kennedy went on national television and he addressed the nation on the evening of October 22nd, 1962. He was both informing the American public of what was going on in Cuba and our response to it and he was also sending a message to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. And in his remarks, he said this. 
It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. That full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union would have included firing the 12 missiles surrounding Altus Air Force Base. Fortunately, disaster was averted and the crisis was resolved peacefully in late October. A dangerous incident did occur, however, when the Atlas missile stored at the Frederick site exploded shortly before noon on May 14, 1964, destroying the site. Fortunately, neither death nor injury happened. Nobody was hurt, nobody was killed, and the nuclear warhead was unaffected. But shortly afterward, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara announced that the Atlas F missiles would be phased out by the end of June 1965. Considered obsolete, the Atlas missile was replaced by the Titan missile. Just that quickly, Oklahoma's part in the nation's missile program ended. Most of the launch facilities built at break speed around the country during the most dangerous period of the Cold War sit empty and unused. After the Atlas missiles were decommissioned and phased out, the military declared that the missile sites were surplus and subject to sale through the General Services Administration. All 12 of the Altus area missile sites were sold to private owners. Today, school districts in Snyder and Hollis, Granite and Fargo, Texas still use the land having placed FFA barns or other agriculture education facilities and equipment at the sites. The Atlas missile program was needed to deter a Soviet nuclear attack and defend the United States if deterrence failed. Southwest Oklahoma played a crucial role in the nation's nuclear arsenal then by building the Atlas F missile sites and housing those missiles during the most dangerous years of the Cold War. The missile sites near Altus Air Force Base at Granite and Cache and Hobart and Willow and several other locations provided jobs to people like Jerry Brewer and Clyde Brewer and lots of other people. And boy, was my mom happy that my dad got him a job. She was with child and they needed money. And he was able to save the $200 needed to pay the hospital so that my oldest sibling, my oldest brother, could be born. And they were grossly overcharged and should get a partial refund. An, ec an economic boost for the state, jobs for people like my father and grandfather. Most importantly, the missiles of Oklahoma kept all Americans safe during the most dangerous period in the history of the world. Granite is one of those sites I mentioned. The school system in Granite owns the property. The FFA barn is placed there. Last December, as I was really getting into all of this, I had the opportunity to visit a couple of the sites. I visited the Granite site with my father, my father and my two youngest children, my two youngest sons, loaded up and we went to Granite. We got permission from the school system, so we were not trespassing, and we walked around, and we found the pad, we found the 65-ton doors, and that's what it looked like back in December 2016. Well, we had already been to the Willow Missile site, because before going to the Granite site, we had been to the Willow site. My father, my two youngest children, and I loaded up in the van and we headed from Elk City south to Willow down Highway 34. I had first contacted the property owner making sure that I was not trespassing. I didn't want to get shot. This is what the Willow Atlas missile site looked like between 1962 and 1965. This view is from the east looking west. If you've ever driven through Greer County down Highway 34 or 283, they overlap here. If you drive south from Elk City, you call it 34. If you drive south from Sayre down 283, you call this 283. Well, this is the missile site at Willow looking west toward the highway. 
This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Willow site from a different vantage point in between 62 and 65. I don't know if you can see these mountains in the background. I can bring my cursor. In the upper left, above the Atlas missile on the left side of the screen, you might be able to make out the Quartz Mountains near Granite. The picture on the right is the entrance to the Launch Control Center. I took this picture at the Willow site December 2016. The missile, you can see in the photo on the left, the missile protruding from the silo through the doors. On the right, you see grain storage and equipment sitting on the same pad where that missile had been in the early 1960s. Grain storage and equipment. In each LCC, there was an escape hatch for the five-man Air Force crew. Now, each site was built to theoretically withstand a bomb blast at the surface. But just in case of catastrophe, a fire, for example, and the five-man crew needed to escape immediately and were unable to do so through the stairs, climbing up the stairs and, and exiting the door, the entrance and exit for the LCC, an escape hatch was built. There was a round tube through the ceiling. You could pull a lever and a door would open and there was a tube you could climb through the 40 feet to the surface and escape that way if necessary. But each tube was filled with four tons of sand. In fact, there was a sign by the lever that opened the door saying, for emergency escape only, releases four tons of sand when opened. So don't open it unless it's a real emergency. Last December, I had been researching and I'd been writing and I told a friend of mine about my research about the missile sites and he said you know when I was a teenager at an undisclosed western Oklahoma high school back in the 1980s a friend of mine and I used to go down to Willow we'd take our ropes and we would climb in because the doors to the silo were open and one day my friend brought me a sign he said I took this from Willow Back in the 1980s, it's yours. And I said, thank you for trespassing as a teenager and stealing this. You're guilty of at least two crimes. Ironically, this person's now a lawyer. Now, I am an inveterate rule follower. I tow the line, and I thought, I'll do the right thing. I will contact the owner of the Willow site and say, I've got this sign. You want it back? Never thinking that he would actually take me up on it. He took me up on it. I gave it back to him. But at least I have a picture and a really great story to tell if I ever speak at a missile site seminar. Last June, my father and I had the opportunity to go inside of one of these missile sites in southwest Oklahoma, where a man now lives. He was gracious. He showed us around. He allowed us to take photos. And this is the entrance. In the old days, it was the entrance to the LCC. Now it's the entrance to his home, to the LCC. This is the door. I call it the door. You can see down here, I don't know, can you see the welcome mat that says better dead than red? Actually, I'm just kidding. It just says welcome. I'm just kidding. There we are, the owner, the, the man who graciously allowed us into his home. He let us look around. And looking at this photo, I'm struck by how bad my posture is. I really need to drink more milk. It was very hot that day. On the outside of the door, you, you enter, and then you go down immediately to flights of stairs. T-O, flights of stairs. You go flights of stairs. I wanted to stop, and I think my father may have taken this photo looking back up. You walk down sets of stairs, and then you turn and you walk down more sets of stairs, and then you turn and walk down more sets of stairs. And at the very bottom, I was shocked to uh, meet Maxwell Smart in Agent 99. He said, I missed it by that much. Would you believe? The blast doors built to withstand a nuclear blast at the surface. Very heavy, but open nicely on their hinges, but they are very heavy. Inside the LCC, a veritable museum itself, it was lovely getting to go and getting to learn from a man who knows quite a bit himself about the Atlas program. Remember, there was a tunnel connecting the LCC to the silo. The photo on the right is the tunnel. 
that I got to walk through toward the silo. Another very thick door. Exiting the tunnel. And I wanted to show you this. This is near the entrance to the silo itself. Earlier I said that the walls were very thick. The silo walls were two and a half feet toward the very bottom, but at the very top for about, oh, golly, about 30 feet to the surface. The walls were nine feet thick. From one corner to the other corner near that light, the walls going to the surface of the silo, the walls were nine feet thick. You open the silo door and look inside, and it's very dark and very scary. The missile itself was surrounded by what was called the crib. It was at least a 15-story structure, and the crib was suspended from four springs to absorb shock just in case, to, in case of a blast, a type of shock absorber to maintain equilibrium. Well, those springs were attached to four large hangers. This is one of those hangers. These are my cruddy Adidas tennis shoes, my missile sight tennis shoes at the bottom. I wanted to show this photo of my feet looking down into the abyss, into the bottom of the silo. We're about 40 feet underground, which means it's still about another 130, 135 feet to the bottom. Hoping that I did not fall, learning that my balance was very good. I said earlier that the historic marker had arrived in Greer County. Not only has it arrived in Greer County, but yesterday I oversaw its installation. This is the Willow Historic Marker. $2,340. And I got help from the old Greer County Museum in Mangum and I provided the text. And it is available for view if you travel down Highway 34 or Highway 283. And it's really quite nice. And I wanted to show this photo of the Willow side on the left and then the current day side on the right with the historic marker in the foreground. In the back on the left, you can see this Quonset hut. This is that Quonset hut. Here is the entrance to the launch control center. I don't know if you can make it out, but right here, that is the entrance to the launch control center. About 100 yards east of the historic marker. Do you like sneak peeks? I like sneak peeks. I mentioned that I have a, a paper that's coming out in the Chronicles of Oklahoma. This is a sneak peek of the upcoming fall edition that should be available by mid-December. This is probably what the first page will look like. And the title is The Miss Missiles of Oklahoma, Southwest Oklahoma's Role in the American Cold War Nuclear Arsenal, 1960 through 65, which is a sufficiently long and boring and academic sounding title. In fact, the title of this paper is longer than the first college paper I ever wrote. It's just that long. In 1992, author David McCullough was giving an interview talking about the biography he had written of President Truman called Truman. And he was asked why he wrote it, and he said, well, I enjoyed writing about the president and his life and his entry into politics because I was writing about America. Because we must be reminded who we are. My family goes back to western Oklahoma before statehood. Beckham County and Washita County, we were here before statehood. We were here shortly afterward. We homesteaded. We've been here a long time. And if your family is like that, you probably feel like I do, that our ancestors lived through homesteading, and they lived through the Great Depression, and they lived through the Dust Bowl and fighting World War II and energy industry booms and busts. But in the 1960s, we... Oklahomans, we Americans, built these Atlas F nuclear missile sites in southwest Oklahoma. We were the tip and the spear of the American Cold War nuclear arsenal. We were the lightning and the thunder. And we need to know these things, which is why I was adamant about writing the paper. And I was adamant about placing the historic marker. And I was adamant about talking to you and everybody else who will listen to me including my family who hates talking about Atlas missiles now because they're tired of hearing it. But it's very important to me. Why? Because we must be reminded who we are. And this is part of who we are. Thank you very much. I'll take a couple of questions if anybody has some.
And if we don't get to all of them or you're just too shy, I will gladly stick around afterward and, and answer as many questions as you would like to ask me. Questions? We have microphone. If you'd like to come down and, and ask a question, feel free. And if you don't want to come down, I will be available afterward to speak to you privately if you would like. Anyone else? Yes, sir. There were six total pubs like Alpha's Air Force Base in Oklahoma. You had Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, let's see, Kansas, Nebraska, and Springfield, New York. I'm still trying to figure out that at Plattsburgh. Those were the six. They wanted them inland as far as possible away from from the Soviet submarine launched missiles, but close enough to hit their targets in the Soviet Union. Available, they needed to be near support facilities and whenever possible uh, on government owned property. And so there were certain criteria. Funny <laughs> you should ask, I asked this very question, and it's just like it's come up with We could have our technical help up here for a second for two novices. <laughs>
Landry, I'll be sure to tell that attorney you did not mention his name. <laughs> Our next speaker, Michael Dobbs, is a journalist and author of a best-selling book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, One Minute to Midnight, Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro on the Brink of Nuclear War. In a cover review in the New, in the New York Times book review, Richard Holbrook wrote that the book was filled with insights that will change the views of experts and help inform a new generation of readers. Dobbs first became interested in the missile crisis while covering the collapse of the Soviet Union for the Washington Post between 1988 and 1993. As a reporter for the Washington Post, Dobbs, witne Dobbs witnessed anti-communist revolutions and wars in Yugoslavia, Poland, China, and the Soviet Union. His Cold War trilogy consists of Six Months in 1945, From World War to Cold War, One Minute to Midnight, Kennedy, Khrushchev, and Castro on the Brink of Nuclear War, and Down with Big Brother, The Fall of the Soviet Empire. Other books include Madeleine Albright, A 20th Century Odyssey, and Saboteurs, The Nazi Raid on America. Dobbs has taught courses on the Cuban Missile Crisis at the University of Michigan, Georgetown University, and American University. He is currently working on a book about U.S. refugee policy prior to World War II for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I know that Michael's had a busy day today. We've taken him to some missile sites in the Stafford Museum and hopefully given him a taste of southwestern Oklahoma. So if you would, please give a great southwestern Oklahoma welcome to Mr. Michael Dobbs. I'm as uh, technologically incompetent as uh, Landry. Um, it's great to be here at Southwestern, and thank you very much, uh, President Beutler, for inviting me. I'm really, it's really interesting for me to come here and particularly to uh, visit the missile site uh, today and uh, to listen to Landry's fascinating talk about uh, local, reconstructing local history and a particular part of history that I'm interested in, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, as uh, President Boatler mentioned, I wrote a book called One Minute to Midnight uh, about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I called it One Minute to Midnight after the Doomsday Clock, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, in the late uh, 50s and the early 60s, as the world seemed to be uh, hurtling toward nuclear destruction, a group of scientists developed something they called the doomsday clock, how close we are to midnight. And we were probably closer to midnight than ever before or since uh, during the 13 days of October 1962. Um, my book deals with those 13 days, and it deals with one day in particular, uh, October the 27th, 1962, 55 years ago tomorrow, uh, when, uh, which is probably the most dangerous day of the missile crisis, the most dangerous day of the Cold War, um, and they called it Black Saturday. Uh, I'll tell you about it a little more uh, later on. Um, but this isn't just a matter of uh, history. Um, we're now living through um, perhaps not quite as perilous times, but certainly uh, where seem to be heading towards some kind of nuclear confrontation with another small country across the ocean uh, in North Korea, 
the North Korean crisis has been called a slow motion uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and I think as we uh, think about how to deal with North Korea, there are many lessons to be drawn from the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I'll uh, go into in a moment. Um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the 13 days and the Cuban Missile Crisis, what happened, uh, just to, um, for those people who uh, don't know all the details, I should describe a little uh, about what happened, and then I'll draw some lessons from the missile crisis. Um, so, the, in order to understand our confrontation with Cuba, you have to know a little bit about Cuban history. Uh, Fidel Castro uh, led a revolution against uh, an American-backed dictator called Batista, and uh, he came to power in on January the 1st, 1969, after leading a rebellion uh, in the jungles of uh, Cuba. Um, at the, when he came to power, he was not a communist. Um, uh, he was a revolutionary, but he was perceived as a threat to US interests, um, particularly when he started nationalizing US companies on the island. And um, he gradually gravitated toward the Soviet Union, not so much as a matter of ideology, but as a matter of uh, protection, uh, defense of his uh, revolution. Uh, it took about a year for him to declare that his revolution was in fact a communist revolution. Um, and he really sought Soviet support to counter uh, what he perceived as an American threat to his revolution and ultimately an American attempt to overthrow him. Of course, there were attempts to overthrow him. Um, first of all, a, a CIA-sponsored invasion at the Bay of Pigs, a series of assassination attempts against uh, Castro himself, and a campaign of subversion and sabotage that was called Operation Mongoose, which wasn't all that effective um, but in the eyes, at least, of the Cubans, uh, they were convinced that the United States were, was determined one way or the other to uh, get rid of Castro and put an end to the, uh, to the Cuban Revolution. And that is really why Castro sought uh, Soviet support. Um, so there was a kind of mistakes, I would think, were made on both sides. First of all, we uh, put Castro in a frame of mind in which he thought that there was an imminent threat to his power in Cuba. And on the other hand, the Cubans and their Soviet sponsors reacted by uh, deploying nuclear weapons to Cuba just 100 miles or so away from American shores, sure. Um, so Kennedy is elected in 1960, um, just over a year after Castro comes to power in Cuba. Uh, in 1961, he holds a meeting with uh, Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna. And that meeting doesn't go well at all. It turns into a kind of test of wills between these two leaders. Um, Khrushchev doesn't form a very good impression of Kennedy. He says, he scoffs at Kennedy. He says, he's young enough to be my son. Khrushchev thinks he can push Kennedy around. And as a result of that, uh, Kennedy has to show that he is tough enough to deal with Khrushchev. Uh, Kennedy comes away from that meeting in Vienna uh, shaken. Uh, somebody compares it to the meeting in Munich between Hitler and Neville Chamberlain of, of England, um, that uh, uh, Kennedy is, sort of feels that his uh, authority is being challenged by Khrushchev and he has to do something to reassert his authority, otherwise gradually the uh, Soviet Union will take advantage of the United States and, and uh, be able to uh, uh, 
take advantage of the US weakness, particularly in Berlin. Um, so Kennedy is of the frame of mind that he feels that he needs to do something to uh, show that he's not going to be intimidated by the leader of Soviet uh, communism. Um, so the Soviets take a decision to send missiles halfway around the world to uh, this little island of Cuba, um, which of course is in the, the, as far as America is concerned, is in the Western Hemisphere and part of the, uh, what should be the American sphere of influence. Uh, it's called Operation Anadia, and it's really for a country as, I mean, uh, the Soviet Union had nuclear missiles, but in many ways it was an extremely backward, poor country. In the space of two or three months, in, from August 1962 to October 1962, this rather backward country managed to, to send uh, a military force of 40,000 men across the ocean, uh, armed with uh, 200 or so nuclear warheads, including missiles that can reach the United States with those warheads, under the, virtually under the nose of uh, American uh, intelligence agencies, without the United States understanding what was happening. We realized that there was this armada of Soviet ships going to Cuba, but we didn't know what was on the ships. We suspected that there was military equipment, but uh, we didn't know for sure. There was a debate in the American intelligence agencies about exactly what was being taken to Cuba. Uh, this on the left is a photograph taken from one of those Soviet ships of a US uh, reconnaissance plane flying over. You'll notice that the um, uh, so the Russian on the deck of the ship is dressed in a checkered shirt. They went under disguise as agricultural technicians. Um, the man on the right is uh, Colonel Nikolai Belaborodov. Uh, he was actually in charge of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. All those nuclear warheads came under the, were his responsibility. Um, the Russians called the, the joke was this was not Operation Anadia, but op Operation Checkered Shirt, because all the Russians wore the same type of shirt. They, they, they'd all been issued this uh, kind of standard uh, camouflage, um, which became rather obvious after a while, but um, uh, uh, they, they didn't wear their military uniforms. Um, they also, in order to fool the American reconnaissance planes, uh, the Russian soldiers uh, rarely came up on deck, or they could only come, they were allowed to come up on deck, for example, if, if it was their birthday or some kind of special day. They were, uh, for the most part, when they came across, uh, they were all in, uh, in terrible conditions, uh, uh, in holds, cargo holds, uh, uh, below decks, and uh, when the CIA was trying to calculate how many Russians were coming across, they thought perhaps uh, five or 6,000 Russians uh, were coming across in these ships, but in fact there were 40,000. Uh, it was an army of 40,000 uh, uh, Russians uh, that was being transported to Cuba, and they came with nuclear missiles. The main missile that they brought to Cuba that could reach the United States was called the R-12, uh, was the Russian nomenclature. Uh, the Americans called it the SS-4. Um, the Russians had uh, paraded, they have the habit, actually just like the North Koreans or the uh, Chinese nowadays, they parade their missiles in public uh, on uh, major holidays. And the R-12 had been paraded through Red Square, which of course uh, gave uh, Western military attaches the opportunity to photograph it, to discover exactly the length of the missile, the length of the warhead, um, which later became very useful in identifying it. So between August of 1962 and October 1962, 
Um, there was a long debate in uh, American intelligence agencies about exactly what kind of equipment the Soviets were bringing to Cuba. And, but it was only on October the 14th, 1962, that, uh, the United, that the CIA actually was able to discover uh, that the, uh, the, the Soviets were bringing nuclear-capable missiles to Cuba, missiles that were capable of reaching uh, U.S. territory. Um, the missiles were discovered by U-2 uh, uh, pilot uh, Richard Heiser, flying at an altitude of 60,000 feet, and um, he uh, photographed one of the missile sites at a place called San Cristobal. This is not the picture taken by uh, uh, Richard Heiser, the U-2 pilot. Uh, this was taken a few days later by a low-level reconnaissance plane, but it gives you uh, a, a much more detailed uh, overview of that same site. You can see the oxidizer tanks, the, the uh, missile shelter tent, uh, the fuel tank, uh, the trailers for the fuel tanks, um, a missile erector, i.e. the equipment that uh, brought the missile from a horizontal position to a vertical position. Uh, and it was the length of the missile tent that enabled the CIA to identify this as a R-12 missile, or as they called it, an SS-4. That they had equipment that could precisely measure the length of that missile tent, and that really put an end to the debate about whether the Soviets were bringing nuclear-capable missiles to Cuba or not. After this, these photographs, there was no doubt in the President's mind that the Soviets had introduced uh, nuclear uh, missiles in Cuba, something that he had warned them against a few weeks before. He had, Kennedy had said, if the Soviets attempt to bring offensive nuclear missiles into Cuba, we will, regard, we will have to take action to prevent it. So he had drawn a red line in the sand, and he had committed U.S. prestige and authority to forcing the Soviets to remove their missiles from Cuba. Um, he was told about the presence of the missiles on October the 14th, which was the first day of the, you've probably heard of the 13 days, they begin on October the 14th, when the president is informed about uh, the deployment of Soviet missiles in Cuba. Uh, the president forms uh, a group of trusted aides called the EXCOM, the, or the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, which meets in almost permanent session in the cabinet room of the White House, uh, to decide what to do about what to do. And there's a debate. Some people say, well, we should immediately take the missiles out. Um, then Kennedy says, well, can we be sure to get all the missiles? Is there time before these missiles uh, are capable of being launched? And the CIA tells them, well, we probably have a bit of time yet. The work on the missile sites is not complete. Uh, you have a few days in which to make up your mind. So instead of taking the missiles out, which was uh, the initial, um, uh, his initial thinking, instead of doing that, he uh, imposes a naval blockade on Cuba, um, which he announces in public uh, on uh, a, few, a couple of days later in that speech that you saw, uh, a brief extract that Landry showed. Uh, he says that... Uh, we will not allow Soviet ships uh, carrying offensive military equipment to, uh, to, to, to move towards Cuba. And he, uh, the US Navy uh, uh, was deployed along this blockade line uh, roughly 500 nautical miles from, uh, from Cuba. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the, uh, there's a, movie called 13 Days, which shows this um, so-called eyeball-to-eyeball moment with Soviet ships advancing towards the blockade line, and at the last moment, they turn back. 
um, and the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, is, said to, is meant to have said, uh, we were eyeball to eyeball, and the other fellow just blinked. It's part of the mythology of the missile crisis. Actually, when I did the research for my book, I was amazed to discover that the uh, Soviet ships who were still moving towards Cuba never reached the blockade line. They, were, they turned back before uh, they reached the blockade line, and they were never more than 100 or 200 miles from, uh, from the US ships. So Khrushchev had already decided uh, on October the 24th, when the blockade came into force, that he was not going to run the blockade with his uh, ships carrying, um, carrying military equipment. Um, so, while this is all going on, uh, the U.S. forces and U.S. nuclear forces, the Strategic Air Command, is going to ever higher levels of alert. Um, I think it's on October the 25th that the Strategic Air Command, um, you see uh, the uh, head of Strategic Air Command, General uh, Thomas Power there, announcing uh, DEFCON 2, which is the second highest alert. DEFCON 1 is, means imminent nuclear war. And he announced that uh, in the clear uh, to sack bases all over the United States, including here in Oklahoma, uh, deliberately uh, intending that the message would be intercepted uh, by the Soviet Union to show, uh, to signal the Soviet Union that the United States was prepared to go to war if necessary uh, in order to uh, force uh, the Soviets to pull, out, pull their missiles out of Cuba. But as the, uh, the SAC uh, and other elements of the US military uh, went to higher levels of nuclear alert, um, there was always a risk of something going wrong. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but uh, during the Gulf War, um, Donald Rumsfeld, who was then Defense Secretary, uh, he said, well, when you go to war, stuff happens. And stuff began to happen during the 13 days of October 1962, all along the, uh, this uh, uh, Cold War battlefront. One of the things that happened uh, was that we didn't know, but the Soviets also had submarines. We knew about the submarines, but we didn't know that they, these submarines were armed with nuclear torpedoes. And the US Navy was trying to bring the submarines to the surface uh, by throwing down depth charges. And uh, on one of the submarines, um, you could imagine the tension inside the, uh, this sort of kind of tin can, World War era, World War II era, uh, submarine, very claustrophobic. Um, the sailors had, uh, there were terrible conditions on, on board the submarines. There were explosions all around the submarine. And uh, it came down to the question of whether they would use their nuclear torpedoes against uh, the uh, US warships that were trying to bring them to the surface. Uh, I spoke to one of those submarine captains and uh, in Russia, and uh, he, took, he told me about a conversation they had on board the submarine where uh, it came down to the arguments between three officers, uh, one of whom wanted to use the nuclear torpedo and two of whom didn't. Um, on October the 27th, the most dangerous day of the missile crisis, the day they called Black Saturday, uh, a, several things happened. First of all, there was the incident with the submarines. Secondly, over Cuba, a American U-2 was shot down by a Soviet um, uh, uh, SAM missile. Uh, a man called Major Anderson, who was piloting the U-2, was killed. Um, but also something happened that was one of these sort of freak accidents that had nothing to do with the crisis, but 
Uh, it's just, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, stuff happens. Uh, a man, uh, a YouTube pilot called Chuck Maltzby, um, you see him on the left, a former Thunderbird pilot. He was uh, involved in, uh, in air sampling missions to the North Pole from Alaska. Uh, the idea was that U2s, in addition to um, taking reconnaissance photographs, were also involved in taking samples of uh, the atmosphere to uh, detect Soviet nuclear tests. This was a completely routine um, exercise that nobody thought to cancel, even though it was the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Chuck Maltzby flies his U-2. He's meant to go up to close to the North Pole, collect his samples, t turn around, come back to Alaska. Um, as luck would have it, his navigation in those days was all by the stars. He takes a wrong turn at the North Pole, and instead of coming back to Alaska, he ends up over the uh, eastern part of the Soviet Union, the Chukotka Peninsula, on the most dangerous day of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviets send up MiGs to try to force him down um, twice, and then they, the MiGs can't reach high enough to... Um, to, to shoot down a, uh, a U-2, which is flying at 60,000 feet. But uh, then Maltzby runs out of fuel uh, over the Soviet Union. Miraculously, he makes it back to uh, a little airstrip at Kotzebue on the coast of Alaska. And um, when, when uh, JFK hears about what has happened, he says, well, there's always some son of a bitch who doesn't get the word. Um, but this, to me, is an example of the kind of things that can go wrong when uh, you're moving to higher levels of alert. Uh, there are uh, 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 all, all kinds of things can happen that you don't predict. Neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev fully controlled the forces under their command. Christian Kennedy didn't even know that uh, this U-2 uh, had flown over the Soviet Union until it was back in Alaska. Uh, Khrushchev didn't know that uh, another U-2 had been shot down over Cuba. Uh, you know, we like to think that a president has complete control over his, uh, over his forces, but it's not true. He doesn't know and cannot control everything that is happening on the battlefront. There's always, in Donald Rumsfeld's words, there's always stuff that happens. Um, having the two sides having come close to, uh, to nuclear war, uh, Kennedy had already decided that the following week um, if the Soviets didn't back down, he would probably have to send uh, uh, planes over Cuba to take out those sites. Um, but both he and Khrushchev also understood, partly as, an inc as a result of incidents like the uh, incident involving Chuck Maltzby, uh, that the crisis was spinning out of control and they had to bring it to an end. So what happens on the night of uh, October 27th, the same day, uh, Kennedy sends his brother Robert to the Soviet embassy in Washington. And Robert Kennedy meets with the Soviet ambassador and uh, he essentially proposes a deal, which is that we have missiles in Turkey that can reach the Soviet Union, analogous intermediate range missiles. Um, the Soviets will have to pull their missiles out of Cuba. That will be done in public. But in private, uh, after a, couple, a few weeks have gone by, we will pull our missiles out of Turkey. In the meantime, Khrushchev is also looking for a way out of the crisis. Um, and the following day, um, partly because of this influence by this offer from, uh, from the president, uh, he publicly announces that he's going to withdraw his missiles uh, from Cuba. So the crisis is resolved, but it's a close-run thing. 
So what are the lessons to be drawn today for, uh, for the handling of crises today from the 13 days in October 1962? Um, the first lesson, I think, is that uh, the most dangerous, um, uh, the biggest risks that we ran during the missile crisis were not from the conscious decisions of Kennedy and Khrushchev. And both Kennedy and Khrushchev were quite rational uh, people. Uh, left to themselves, they knew uh, that it would be suicide to, uh, insane to bring the world to a nuclear war. They didn't want to get into a nuclear war. But they didn't completely control their own military chains of command. The risk of war in October 1962 did not come from the conscious decisions and wishes of these two leaders. It came from accidents, miscommunication, um, th events like the shooting down of the U-2 in Cuba or this attempted shoot down of another U-2 that had gone astray over the Soviet Union or the uh, this drama aboard the submarines uh, in the Caribbean, uh, or sort of freak accidents on, a, uh, on an American missile site or an, on a Soviet missile site, any of which could have escalated very quickly and uh, uh, in a way that neither leader was able to control. We intended to, uh, the following week, had uh, two s sides not back down, uh, the US had an invasion plan of Cuba. Um, this is a document that I discovered in the National Archives in Washington, uh, a blueprint of the uh, invasion beach, it's Tarara, which is east of Havana. I overlaid it onto a Google, Google map here. But so that the US was planning an invasion of Cuba very similar to the D-Day landings on the beaches of Normandy. What the US did not know was that in addition to the uh, longer range missiles that could reach uh, US territory, the Soviets had tactical nuclear weapons on Cuba that could destroy a, uh, uh, an invasion beachhead, could also destroy the US naval base at Guantanamo. And had those Marines come ashore here at uh, Tarara, uh, there's a high likelihood that uh, local Soviet commanders on Cuba, whether or not they'd been uh, received orders from Moscow, uh, would have used those tactical nuclear weapons against uh, the uh, US Marines coming ashore at Tarara Beach. And then a local, there's, very high chance that a local, uh, 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 a, a small nuclear conflict would have escalated into something uh, much larger. Um, second lesson, I think it helps if the leaders have a sense of history and of the risks of history. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev had direct personal experience of World War II. They'd both served in World War II. Kennedy had uh, commanded a patrol boat out in the Pacific. Uh, he writes to his girlfriend at the time, uh, this war here is a dirty business. Um, he says the, one of Kennedy's favorite sayings, which he had learned as a young um, uh, junior lieutenant, uh, was that the military always screws up. Um, I mean, he had an understanding of what I've called this some son of a bitch moment. He knew that accidents are likely to happen. And I think Khrushchev had a similar sense. Um, he had seen the destruction of his, uh, of, of a large part of the Soviet Union, the destruction of his um, home village in Ukraine. And in fact, one of the letters he sends to Kennedy during the crisis, he the Second World War. He says, war ends when it is rolled through cities and villages everywhere sowing death and destruction. So the experience of the two leaders of war 
I think, served as a constraint on them, particularly when they thought about nuclear war, which was going to be many times worse than the war they had experienced. Um, now, there was a lot of talk about the missile gap in the 1960 election. Uh, Kennedy accused Eisenhower of allowing a missile gap. In fact, the, there was a missile gap, but the missile gap favored the United States, not the Soviet Union. Um, but one of the lessons of Cuba, which I think is relevant today with North Korea, is that nuclear superiority doesn't actually mean very much. Uh, in 1962, we had an advantage over the Soviet Union of at least five or six to one in terms of our missiles that could heat, hit the Soviet Union as opposed to their missiles that could reach uh, US territory. Not only those uh, atlas, atlases in uh, Oklahoma, but uh, also we had submarine-launched uh, missiles, we had um, uh, a fleet of heavy bombers. Um, we had many, many times the number of missiles that the Soviets had that were capable of reaching the United States. But that didn't matter very much to Kennedy. Because the question that Kennedy asked was, okay, could one of these Soviet missiles get through? What would happen if one of them got through? And uh, the, his military chiefs were unable to assure him that um, you know, they, they couldn't promise him that it was possible to take out all the Soviet missiles. They could take out perhaps 99% of the missiles, but they, uh, but they couldn't promise to take them all out. And Kennedy asked, well, what would happen if one Soviet missile landed on American territory? And they said, well, perhaps half a million Americans would die. And uh, Kennedy said, well, that is unacceptable to me. That's more than the, high, the casualty toll of the entire Civil War. Uh, so he, Kennedy later said that you know, even one nuclear missile was a deterrent to him to take offensive action in Cuba. Uh, and we have a similar situation now with North Korea. Of course, we can obliterate North Korea. There's no question about it. We have uh, the same kind of superiority over North Korea that we have over, uh, that we had over Cuba back in 1962. But the threat of even one uh, North Korean missile landing on an American target or an American air base in Korea, South, South Korea, or in Japan, is unacceptable to most American leaders. Um, now, Curtis LeMay had a different view. He thought that the Soviet, that the United States enjoyed sufficient superiority over the Soviet Union to force the other side to back down and even at the risk of a nuclear war, and he was prepared to carry through on his threats. So this was a different difference of opinion between uh, the president and Curtis LeMay. Ultimately, of course, uh, JFK's uh, opinion prevailed. Another parallel between now and 1962, the question of imperfect intelligence. What did we know and when did we know it? Um, the CIA knew a lot about the, or they learned eventually a lot about the Soviet military buildup in Cuba. They knew, they were late to find out, but they identified the missile sites. Uh, they identified SAM sites, that, uh, i.e. sites that could um, bring down American planes. Uh, surrounding the island. They discovered all kinds of airfields, but there was a lot that they didn't know at the time. Um, as I talked about earlier, they completely miscalculated the number of Soviet troops on Cuba. The original estimate was around 8,000, uh, or around 4,000, later increased to eight to 10,000, when in fact there were 42,000 Soviet troops on Cuba. Um, here they are again in their checkered shirts. Um, the photograph on the left here is actually of a Russian circus company. Um, 
that came to entertain the Soviet troops on Cuba. Um, and in the, on the front here, you can see a very famous Russian clown. He's called Oleg Popov, who came out to entertain the Soviet troops. Um, but we had no idea that what purported to be agricultural technicians, as you can see, they're not agricultural technicians. This is a missile regiment on parade. Um, we identified some of the uh, Soviet weapon systems. We identified the SAM sites fairly early on. We identified the R-12s on October the 14th. Um, but there were many Soviet uh, military equipment, much Soviet military equipment on Cuba that we never detected. We never detected uh, these tactical nuclear weapons that have, could have been used against an American uh, invasion force and could have been used against, uh, against the Guantanamo naval base. Uh, we didn't know where the Soviet nuclear warheads were, were located. We knew where the missiles were, but we didn't know where the warheads were stored. And the most important piece of information for the president was to find out um, when the warheads would be mated with the missiles. The CIA was unable to answer that crucial question. Um, it was only actually when I wrote my uh, book and did the research for my book, both in Russia and uh, the United States, that I found out about uh, the Soviet plans to destroy Guantanamo. Nikita Khrushchev had told a visiting uh, American businessman that uh, if the Americans invade Cuba, they'll find out what happens. We will destroy Guantanamo the first day. And we thought it was bluster. But in fact, the, as I was able to establish in my book, uh, the Soviets move, moved tactical nuclear missiles right up to the periphery of the Guantanamo naval base and were prepared to uh, take out the naval base in the event of a U.S. invasion of Cuba. Um, I think another question that is worth pondering is the what's called the madman card. Um, and we think of uh, Kim Jong-un as a madman, we think of Fidel Castro as a madman, uh, which is partly the weapon that weak countries use against a strong country. Um, they have to convince the strong country that uh, they're prepared to do anything to, uh, to defend themselves. It's a bit like the, there's the, in game theory, there's uh, two vehicles that are hurtling towards each other uh, in this game of chicken. The question is, who will veer away at the last moment? And the madman uh, puts his foot on the accelerator and doesn't veer away. Of course, that's one way of getting the other, the antagonist, to back down. But what happens if both sides keep their foot on the accelerator? Uh, the madman card in 1962 was played very effectively by Fidel Castro. The slogan of the Cuban Revolution was patria or muerte, fatherland or death. Um, and Kim Jong-un, uh, nicknamed Rocket Man, has a similar kind of strategy, I think. But this is a strategy that uh, works for weak countries. Um, I'm not so sure it works for stronger countries um, because uh, more powerful countries like the United States have more to lose than weaker countries. Um, so it's very tempting for the United States or a U.S. leader to pl th play the madman card back to the badman. But uh, you also run great risks in doing that. In 1962, of course, um, Fidel Castro, he didn't actually control any nuclear weapons himself. The weapons were under the control of the Soviets. So Fidel Castro was able to play the madman card, but he didn't have any nuclear weapons to back it up. And in the end, uh, Khrushchev decided he could not trust Castro with nuclear weapons. And that was one of the reasons why Khrushchev ended up um, withdrawing his weapons from Cuba. Um, 
So the real question in the Cuban Missile Crisis was whether the rational actors could impose their will on the irrational ones. And um, in the end, I argue in my book that paradoxically, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev ended up on the same side. They were both very aware of um, the risks of nuclear war. They'd been through war themselves. And they, although they were uh, led hostile superpowers, they ended up with a similar sense of responsibility for the fate, not only of their own countries, but of the whole of mankind. And I think this was best expressed by Jackie Kennedy after uh, JFK's assassination. Jackie wrote a, um, a personal letter, handwritten letter to, um, to Khrushchev. And I'll just quote briefly from the letter. Jackie writes, you and he, i.e. you, Khrushchev, and my husband, were adversaries, but you were allied in a determination that the world should not be blown up. The danger which troubled my husband was that war might be started not so much by the big men as by the little ones. While big men know the need for self-control and restraint, little men are sometimes moved more by fear and pride. So the real question in 2017, as it was in 1962, is will our leaders turn out to be big men or little men? And a lot is going to depend on the answer to that question. Thank you very much. I'd love to um, respond to any questions you might have or uh, hear your comments either on my presentation or on Landry's. Thank you very much. In the Philippines, um, I mean, there were intelligence gathering operations all over the world, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't run across that directly. I mean, there was a lot of human intelligence coming in, particularly from Cuba. I mean, people would see these missiles trundling through the streets of Cuba, and we had a, still had a lot of agents in Cuba, actually, who were sending reports back to the U.S. But the problem with the human sources is that it was always imprecise. I mean, one guy would say, I saw a 30-foot tube going from Havana to somewhere else. And another person would say, I saw a 50-foot tube. And another person would say, I saw a 70-foot tube. But it, so the, the, all the, these reports came into the CIA, and they were contradictory. So the CIA took the position that the Soviets would not run the risk, run the risk of sending nuclear weapons all across the ocean to Cuba because they'd never done anything like that before. So they kind of fit the intelligence that they were receiving into that view that they previously had about the Soviet Union and the risks that the Soviet Union was uh, willing to run. Um, so the reports of, some reports were kind of suppressed, and, but it was not until they had the photographs of the missile sites, and they were able to measure the precise length of those missiles. They knew that these were not um, you know, short-range rockets. They were, that would 
targeted against planes, they were uh, this R-12 missile that they'd seen paraded through Red Square. The length was crucial, and they were never able to get the, the precise length from these human sources. And the rather, you know, this is the problem with human intelligence, that um, it sort of lacks precision, and you don't know who to believe, who not to believe. And we saw the same thing in the run-up to the war in Iraq. Um, so in the end, the intelligence that they were prepared to go uh, to, to base decisions on and the intelligence that resulted in the uh, president declaring a naval blockade was uh, technical aerial intelligence from the U-2s and later from uh, low-level reconnaissance planes over Cuba. But, yeah, the, 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 there were just too many contradictory reports coming in, probably from the Philippines, among other places. Yeah. Right. Well, I told you I didn't know about the, um, the plans to destroy Guantanamo. Um, we didn't know about the presence of, so of Soviet tactical nuclear weapons on Cuba. To the, I mean, there were some suspicions that they had them, but we didn't really find, uh, establish that until a series of conferences what made the Cuban Missile Crisis so interesting to study is that uh, uh, the or original histories were written from the American point of view. Um, so it was all based on American sources. But after the end of the Cold War, they, it became possible to speak to Russians and to get Russian documents. And you brought the Russians together with the Americans in a series of conferences, and eventually they also included the Cubans in these conferences. So you were able to study it, not just from the American perspective, but the American, the Russian, and the Cuban. And by triangulating all that information, we discovered a whole lot of things like, that we didn't know before, including, I mentioned the incident involving the submarines. I mentioned the incident involving uh, Chuck Moltsby and his U-2 getting lost over, uh, uh, over the Soviet Union. Um, that, that was known, um, it's referenced a little bit in earlier histories. Um, but I think my book goes in, uh, into it in much more detail uh, than was known before. And uh, I was able to get all that information partly from Chuck Moldsby's family, um, but partly from um, you know, uh, piecing together. Uh, actually, that, a lot about that operation is still classified because the U.S. had the ability to track. Um, they, we were reading... Uh, Soviet intelligence, so Soviet um, uh, monitoring of Maltzby's flight. And uh, uh, that is still um, classified. So a lot of documents have not been released about that uh, Maltzby U-2 flight. Uh, so I mainly got that from unofficial sources. Uh, I mean, now, you know, Maltzby's uh, uh, other U-2 pilots talk about it. Maltzby, Maltzby's no longer alive, but he left a very interesting memoir um, there are bits and pieces I discovered, including the map of where uh, uh, Maltzby flew over the Soviet Union. So I think I was pretty much able to piece it all together, but actually there's more to be discovered about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the Soviet Union was um, a dictatorship with complete control over information. So uh, they, I mean, very little of that information got back to the Soviet Union. Of course, it was spun as, um, you know, uh, the, the, the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, making, you know, he responsible for... Uh, keeping the peace of the world. So, you know, only very fragmentary information got back to ordinary Russian citizens. And Russian citizens were 
kept largely in the dark throughout the missile crisis. The American students in Moscow who, you know, while uh, ordinary Russians didn't really know what was going on in the same way that Americans knew what was going on because of the state controls over the, over the media. So, um, you know, there wasn't the same kind of reaction in Russia as there would have been in America at that kind of... But what there was, within the elite, uh, there was a reaction because um, uh, other Soviet leaders perceived it as a humiliation and uh, Castro perceived it as a humiliation uh, that he'd had to... Uh, been forced to retreat, that Khrushchev had been forced to retreat. And uh, if you remember, Khrushchev was uh, uh, forced out of office a couple of years later, 1964. Um, and one of the accusations against him um, by the, his, the other members of the Politburo was that uh, you know, A, he had you know, com been completely reckless in sending missiles to Cuba in the first place, and then he had allowed the United States to bully him, so it was used, you know, as a uh, it was used against him when they when, uh, a couple of years later. So, any or if you've got any more questions for uh, Landry, please. Um, otherwise, yeah, yeah. The first of what? Uh, in August 1962. Um, Yeah, the twi I think the decision was taken in June or July in the summer of 1962. And there's a lot of debate about why it was taken. Um, and my personal view, and I think is the view of most, well, certainly of most Soviet historians now, is that the Christian, I mean, there's, of course, there's a mixture of motivations. But, I mean, one motivation was just to... Um, equalize the balance of power because they had many less missiles than we did. But the main motivation was to defend the Cuban Revolution. I mean, there was a kind of emotional attachment of the Russians, particularly Khrushchev, to this rather romantic revolution that was taking place in Cuba. And they were not willing to, I and mean, they felt that if they did not intervene in one way or the other, that would be the end of the Cuban Revolution and the end of Fidel Castro, and it would be they weren't willing to allow that to happen. So, but you know, Khrushchev was very impetuous, and uh, it was a decision that he took personally. Against the, he didn't really consult uh, most of his colleagues on the on the Politburo. Um, so, without looking into, I mean, in his memoirs, he said that his main motivation was the defense of the Cuban Revolution. I think that's probably true. Yeah, well, that was uh, the question is about um, how do the non aligned countries react? I mean, it, since it only lasted for 13 days, there wasn't much uh, opportunity for um, non aligned countries to take a position. Um, and there were countries like Brazil were attempting to mediate. And the question that you raise in particular of our missiles in Turkey. Um, that was really, I mean, it was an affront to Khrushchev. Khrushchev had what they call a dacha, i.e. a summer retreat, on the other side of the Black Sea. And he would take people out to his terrace, and he would point across the Black Sea and say to his guest, uh, what do you see across the Black Sea? And uh, they would look across the Black Sea, he would give them a pair of binoculars, and they wouldn't say anything. They, uh, they, they would say, well, we just see sea. And uh, Khrushchev would grab the binoculars and he would look through them and he says, I see American missiles pointed at my dacha from Turkey. So he took that personally and he was a kind of, the kind of uh, very emotional type of person who uh, was, I mean, that might have also played a role. <laughs> 
So I think it played more of a role with Khrushchev than with the non-aligned countries who didn't play a huge role in the crisis. Well, thank you very much. You've come out on a windy night. If we could, let's have one more round of applause for Mr. Dobbs and Mr. Brewer for excellent presentation. That concludes our seminar. Thank you for coming out. Always remember, send us your students, and hey, you're never too old to come back and get your degree or another degree, okay? So thank you. Have a safe trip home.